Dr. Lyman Page, physics professor, Princeton University. Page is one of WMAP's main designers. His mentor at Princeton, physics professor Dave Wilkinson, tapped him to help build the satellite. MAP, Microwave Anisotropy Probe, renamed WMAP in honor of Wilkinson after he passed away in 2002. I was actually walking by the door to this office. This was Dave Wilkinson's office. Dory said, hey, you want to work on a satellite? So I think that was in uh, early 91. Or, I said, sure. This is uh, the first version we built. It measures microwave radiation. Every time we switch channels on a television that uses an antenna, we get what is called TV snow. 1% of that comes from cosmic microwave radiation. Page designed WMAP's optics to capture the signal. So what happens here is uh, we, where if the radiation, imagine, comes from the sky, comes in, bounces off this, which is the primary reflector, comes up here, then bounces off this element, which is the secondary reflector, and then bounces down into this region where all the instrumentation is. And it's just Page used carbon fibers to make the optics and coated them with aluminum. And we roughened it so that uh, for that brief instant when we knew that the sun would shine on it, so it diffuses the sun rays, not completely, but enough so we didn't fry the instrument. To test if the optics could measure radiation accurately, Page bombarded them with microwaves from the math tower over there. That took us over a year to get right. WMAP uses five frequencies to scan the sky and isolate CMB signal from other sources of radiation. And what you want to do is turn it into an electronic signal. This is the universe bathed in cosmic microwaves 380,000 years after its birth, a gold mine of data that would change cosmological concepts forever. The difference between believing something is true and knowing that it's true. Coming up, the dawning of a new era. On the golden age of cosmology, Princeton University, New Jersey. After 21 years here, Lyman Page has settled down to a routine. Often after work, just to uh, get some exercise and you know, shed any stress, I just jog from the physics department down by the lake and then back up to home, at least three times a week. He lives near Princeton. So, uh, Kagan was confirmed. Four of those Supreme Court justices are now from New York. <laughs> Overrepresented, right? Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn, and I think Queens. Lyman and his wife Lisa, also a physicist, have three sons. Is it hard to uh, be in a household of? Boys, and <laughs> <laughs> boys are, they're easy, pretty easy. Lyman and Lisa studied physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology where they met. I had a friend in his lab and so I was going to meet her. He was standing over a, a doer of a liquid nitrogen and it was like coming out and I didn't have any experience with this so I just asked him if it was dangerous. <laughs> so that's when I learned that the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen <laughs> and, and it isn't dangerous. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so this was our introduction. So we're slowly, you know, redoing the house. Every weekend day I do something on the house just to relax and make things look a little nicer. 
Growing up, I didn't know what it was about. I mean, I always liked math. I was always I did well in math. And then uh, I think when I learned about physics, I just took a, a physics course in, in college. And it was, uh, it, was, it was just fantastic. I said, wow, this really makes sense. And I said, this is what I want to do. Page started researching cosmic microwave background radiation in the 1980s. He's still at it. This is a list that my uh, uh, graduate students made me for my birthday. <laughs> Five years ago. Buy a red Ferrari convertible. <laughs> so it's published one year WMAP data, done. This is a map of the varying intensities of the universe's cosmic microwave, shown by color-coded spots. You see there's a dark blue here and a red here. You can see that there's some size associated with these. We measure them all and take the average size. Here's the neat thing. We can compute from first principles how big on average this is. So just using physics. And we can compute it in, you know, in, in meters. If we could determine this size here, right, we just divide by roughly twice the speed of light, since we know the speed of light, we can get the time that, that light's been traveling to us, which gives us the age of the universe. 13.7 billion years old. And we know it to fractions of a percent. When you saw the, the data the first time, were you stunned? I don't think I was stunned. I think because we had good expectations. But, um, Just in terms of the raw measurement. It's hard to describe how much further ahead it was of anything else that came before it and how accurate the actual measurement was and then precision, how much smaller the error bars are. Hey, Jim. Hi, Lyman. Good to see you. Welcome back. Pleasure. Thank you. I call myself a theorist because I analyze the results of measurements. I compute. Lyman, I call an experimentalist because he builds the apparatus to make measurements and then he makes the measurements. Both sides are needed and very few can work effectively in both sides. It turns out this calibration is what matters. David Spurgle, chair, Princeton's astronomy department and WMAPS theorist. His job was to interpret the data. What we're measuring is its intensity. It, is it brighter in one part of the sky or dimmer? The CMB's intensity is one indication that region in the sky is dense with matter. The seeds from the birth of the universe that later evolved into stars and galaxies. Space itself being found. The early universe is very much like that calm wake. These hot and cold spots are ripples in the sky. So if you imagine dropping rocks into water and to oil, the pattern of ripples are different in water than in oil. So by looking at the pattern we see on the sky, we can figure out what's the universe made of, in a sense, water or oil. Not only that, we can see whether we were throwing in pebbles, or rocks, or boulders. We can use these observations of the small temperature and density variations to learn a lot about the basic properties of the universe. The WMAP data fit what is now known as the standard cosmological model of the universe. Age, 13.7 billion years. Geometry, flat. Composition, 4% atoms, 23% cold dark matter, and 73% dark energy. What stunned physicists is the WMAP's precision. That it has precisely measured the composition of the universe, and it's redirected a lot of the work in particle physics towards finding out the properties of this dark matter and dark energy.
scientists are now scrambling to figure out what cold dark matter and dark energy are. Dark matter surrounds us at this very moment. It's passing through you, passing through me. It just doesn't interact very strongly with us. So dark matter is matter like ordinary matter in that it gravitates, but it's dark. It doesn't emit light. Before WMAP, we knew that there was dark matter. We had some indications of dark energy, but the precision and the beauty of the WMAP results swept away all the doubts in the minds of many physicists, me included. The WMAP has also reinforced the inflation theory that the universe underwent an incredible period of rapid expansion from sub-microscopic to astronomical size. We were able to see the patterns of temperature fluctuations and polarization fluctuations that were predicted. And to uh, see that confirmed was very exciting. Sperger has worked in Princeton for 22 years. I first came here when I was 17 as an undergraduate and uh, then went off to Harvard to get my PhD. Spent a year at Oxford and uh, then came uh, back here. Sperger learned he won this year's Shaw Prize for Astronomy along with Bennett and Page just days before his surgery for thyroid cancer in July. I was actually up in the middle of the night worrying a bit right before my surgery when I got the email about the Shaw Prize. He's now undergoing radiation treatment to remove the cancerous cells in his throat. So this is a radiation detector. So you can see that's the level in background and because of the cancer I'm getting, uh, I swallowed some radioactive iodine. It's now sitting in my thyroid area. You can hear, there's a lot. On this day, Spergo is going to get a scan of his throat. Oh, well, I've been here for two surgeries. One at the, in early June, one in early July and then radiation treatment here uh, last week. The cancer's reminded me of is how little time we all have. How was your day? Time with one's family. Bless right thou, Lord of God. David and his wife, Laura, who's a physician, are both Jewish. They have three children. Uh, what was your reaction when David was diagnosed with thyroid cancer? Uh, disbelief. So I was actually uh, at Newark Airport, fly to a meeting in Atlanta, because all I wanted to do was just fly back home and, and help him deal with it. Um, so uh, he, he, was, he was amazing. I mean, you know, he had the three kids and was seeing the page, you know, seeing the doctors and arranging his surgery and doing all of that, and I wasn't even there to help him for, for that week. We had, uh, I had very good news this uh, afternoon. As you know, I went for a scan yesterday. So I got the results back on the scan, and I'm all clear. After I got my diagnosis, and I wanted to lose some weight and get in shape. I've been in Princeton for a long time. Intellectually, it's a wonderful place. A place scientists can lose themselves in their quest to unravel the ultimate mystery, the holy grail of cosmology. What was there before the Big Bang? Since the beginning of humankind, people have wanted to know about our place in the universe. Where we came from. What is our history? How did the universe around us evolve? The amount of data we have, the amount of knowledge that we've uh, been able to accumulate just very recently is uh, really astounding. Thanks to this satellite, the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, or WMAP. It maps the microwave radiation across the whole sky. 
The cosmic microwave background radiation is light left over from the Big Bang that gave birth to the universe. Coming from when the universe was 380,000 years old. Within this microwave radiation lies the very DNA of the universe, the key to unlocking its mysteries. And it's like a fingerprint to us. We can use these observations to learn a lot about the basic properties of the universe. What's the geometry of the universe? How old is the universe? What's the universe made of? Questions no one has ever come close to answering with pinpoint precision until a team of American scientists banded together in the 1990s, headed by this man. Dr. Charles Bennett, astrophysicist, Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore. I first encountered this equation in freshman physics. Bennett teaches astronomy and physics. Before taking this job in 2005, he worked for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, for 20 years. In 1989, he was deputy chief of one of the three experiments of a satellite mission to study cosmic microwave background radiation. Later, to study the CMB in finer detail, NASA teamed up with Princeton University scientists to design and build the WMAP satellite. Well, I was in charge of the entire project. Every day, I pretty much would get a phone call uh, that usually started with the words, Chuck, we have a problem. And, um, and it could be anything. It could. You know, something that uh, stopped working. It felt like the old story of pushing a boulder up a hill. But his biggest worry was sending the satellite to its destination. The second Lagrangian point, or L2, 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. The satellite has tiny little rockets built on it, and there's a fuel tank in the middle of the satellite, and computer figures out how much of each of these rockets needs to fire for how long to get us there. So we had the satellite go in three loops around the, the Earth as we uh, carefully adjusted and burned our little rockets to, uh, to get the timing just right. So the satellite would just swing by the moon and then pick up some energy from the moon's gravity, basically. And propel the satellite to L2, where it would observe cosmic microwave background radiation. June 30th, 2001, the Day of Reckoning. Ready. SSP. Ready. ACC. Ready. And I was in that control room at the Kennedy Space Center during launch. 10, 9, 8, 7. And so I'm just sitting there with nervous. 3, 2, 1, main engine start and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with the MAP spacecraft. Exploring well, if we didn't get to where we were going, it would have been the end of the mission. Guidance system has started. WMAP reached its destination without a hitch 100 days later. But Bennett paid a high price for such a feat. Four days after the launch, Bennett felt intense pain in his back. I decided maybe I could loosen it up if I exercised. Nothing was making it feel better. So I finally woke my wife up. So I called the doctor, and the doctor said he could be having a heart attack, get him to the hospital as quickly as possible. This is come approaching 3 in the morning. She got in the car, and she drove uh, me to the hospital. And my wife, bless her heart, is, the, is, the, is a rule follower. I obey the stop signs. Near the hospital, even though it was three in the morning, there was a red light. I stopped. <laughs> Chuck, 
yelled at me not to stop for the red light. There's nobody anywhere. You just have to run the red light. Yeah. No. <laughs> Bennett underwent surgery the same night. My gallbladder was apparently 10 times the normal size and gangrene had set in. Hello. Hello. Where are we going? <laughs> Silk Road. Silk Road. You had your good workout this morning at the gym? I had my good workout at the gym. Not as good as I would have liked, but it was at least a workout. Bennett's wife, Renee, is a political science professor, also at Johns Hopkins University. They both studied at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston and met at a Jewish religious service. I am pretty observant with Judaism. At MIT, and a friend of mine said, why don't you come to the conservative reform service? And I said, Jeannie, there are no socially acceptable male graduate students at MIT. She got me to come. And I looked around, and every male looked completely scruffy. Beard unshaven, hair a mess, shirt tails out. There was one guy whose beard was neatly trimmed, and his shirt tails were tucked in. And I turned to my young friend and I said, I'll take him. <laughs> <laughs> and that was Chuck. <laughs> and he I, don't never, know, I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> he never knew what hit him. <laughs> the couple have two sons. Spicy one, right? Yeah, I needed um, I needed chilies, and I didn't have any fresh, so you can see the spicy thing. You know, I was raised in the in a culture of of science. My father was a physicist, and my two hobbies were astronomy and ham radio. I've been interested in the cosmic background radiation since uh, my early years in high school. So 35 plus years I've been interested. It's a complete obsession. Yeah, <laughs>